How are you, my dear friend? I'm calling, of course, from home like everybody else. Are, do you consider yourself on self-quarantine? I do. Are you not letting anyone in? I am not letting anyone in. Because you don't want your cats to be harmed. Cats won't be harmed. This was the whole thing was a conspiracy by cats to keep all of us home. <laughs> to make sure. This is a Persian cat. This is a Persian cat. The father and mother are also my cats, and this is the only one that they have produced. Hey, well, I want to start out here by mentioning that, of course, as you well know, had we and my beloved Sharon gone through with our plans to visit Iran, we would still be in Iran now, 36 hours before we were going to leave. The airline, uh, I think it was Austrian, I think it was Austrian Airlines, stopped flights out of Iran because of the coronavirus. Man, plans and coronavirus laughs. Ah, very good, very good, very good. Less funny, however, is that your beloved bride is in Iran now and unable to leave. True, yeah. How are things in Iran? Well, they're also quarantined in. They haven't left a uh, house for the last three weeks. So they are observing it. Is uh, Panthea going stir crazy? Yes, of course, everybody is. And, uh, you know, good thing is that they're all together. And I'm here with my five cats. So, <laughs> so you don't feel lonely? I don't feel lonely. Okay. Well, so the as advertised here, we are going to talk a little bit about why it is that you don't have these big shopping carts filled to the brim and above with toilet paper in Iran. You will not see that in an Iranian supermarket. Why is that, Professor Sadri, Iranian pal o mine? Well, there are several explanations for that. For one thing, uh, I think what happened here with toilet paper is the good example for the madness of crowds. Human beings don't act rationally when they are in crowds because they participate in the group with their emotions rather than with their reason. So you are at the mega store and you see people grabbing something and you think maybe they know something that you don't, so though you run for it. And uh, this is what in the 19th century they talked about crowds act like children. And so there was a kind of a sociological tradition going on talking about crowds. It became more vigorous when they distinguished the two different kinds of human gathering, crowds and public. You participate in a crowd with your emotions and you participate in the public with your reason. Ooh, I like that. That's nice. I never heard that one. Right. That's so, sociology talk. Right. And, and, and this, uh, there is an American uh, sociologist very prominent in the Chicago School of Sociology. Uh, his name is Robert Ezra Park, and he wrote a thesis in Germany right around the time of 1939 in German. It's called Crowd and Public. Robert Ezra Park went on to produce a lot of very important sociological studies, especially of the city of Chicago. But uh, this was an important contribution to sociological knowledge of how humans act in public as opposed to, to in crowd. I'll tell you a little joke, uh, a joke that they, they was someone played at Burning Man, which may not survive the coronavirus this year either. But at Burning Man, there's people running around and somebody, uh, a couple of people got together and one of them said, the line starts here. <laughs> the line starts here. And two of them got in line behind them. And then people started getting in line behind them. <laughs> and at some point, somebody said, what are we lining up for? No, 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 no. And they, people stopped doing it. <laughs> but <laughs> whatever it was, if people were lining up for it, they might as well be doing it. Uh, so, okay, so there's the madness of crowds is what that it is. But are you saying that the crowds of Tehran are not as mad as the ones here? But there are a lot of different variables that, that, that separate different situations. One of them is culture, how integrated a culture is. Iran is a very ancient uh, culture and it's quite integrated. So you are not going to find the same kinds of situations. 
But there are many examples of the madness of crowds in Iran. Uh, and uh, during the Iranian Revolution, during the celebrations uh, of the death of Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, there are uh, clips of people going quiet, irrational, and doing all kinds of really weird things. So uh, you can find it in any culture. It just happens that in this particular situation, it's a little bit different. Uh, because Iranians uh, basically did, didn't go crazy over toilet paper because uh, Ira the Iranian system of uh, hygiene uh, relies more on a bidet system rather than on a paper ah, system. Uh, Iranians don't hoard toilet paper because Iranians don't normally, or many Iranians don't normally use toilet paper. They use toilet paper now. It has now been normalized, but basically they don't think of it as the only way. It is kind of an auxiliary accoutrement, accoutrement of the of the of the of the bathroom uh, ritual. It's not uh, be all and end all of it. Iranian side bidet is kind of basically is a pitcher, a pitcher of water that, that is very easy to uh, obtain, and and people clean themselves that way. And it is part of the Islamic system. You actually, wherever you go in the Islamic world, you are going to see the the pitcher and the water present in every bath. Are people panicked in Iran because the situation is much more dire for them than in the U.S.? They, they've been hit by sanctions and now this and this very high, you know, this high level of, of travel restrictions everywhere and this high level of infection. So are people just feeling like? What? 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 The WTF? Right, but again, the th the situation in Iran in the last forty years has almost never been normal. Iran went, went through a revolution, and right that after that, ten years of war with Iraq, and then uh, once things started to normalize, uh, then there were sanctions that were imposed on Iran, and. Uh, for a little while, they were lifted uh, during the previous administration, but they were uh, clamped back on by the Trump administration. And uh, in the recent past, Iranians have had experience with almost a hot war with Americans uh, when the general Qasem Soleimani was assassinated and the Iranians retaliated. And then the Iranians, by mistake, they shot a, a Ukrainian airliner. Right. So, in a way, it has been ongoing. Iranians are, this is not new to Iran. Iranians are kind of used to, to disasters. Uh, the stores closed? Are the restaurants closed? Restaurants are not closed in Iran. Again, we are going in that direction. Iran is kind of in a situation not unlike Italy. It could be very disastrous. But uh, there was a celebration of uh, the f a kind of an ancient pre-Islamic fire celebration a couple of nights ago, right before the upcoming New Year, Persian New Year. And a lot of people were all disregarding the quarantine and celebrating it. Some people have been insisting that religious tombs and, and mausoleums should not be closed, although the government, that is a theocracy, is insisting they should be closed. Some people are defying that. So there is some of that going on in Iran, although increasingly we are going towards a kind of a martial law where the revolutionary guards seem to be able to move in and basically impose a kind of a lockdown. Now, you know, this is one of the things that I find sociologically fascinating, which is the ease with and comfort with which Americans accept the National Guard moving in to Dick Van Dyke's neighborhood to rob to New Rochelle, rob him and so in, but and not, not, nobody bats an eye because okay, it's a, it's a danger. So fine, police state tactics. And again, not to say that, that you know that we are on our way to fascism or anything, but it's just interesting to me to note how easily we accept it when you just add a pinch of fear. Yeah, we all, we all have seen this in, in disaster movies, haven't we? You mean that when the, the state comes in with a heavy hand? Right, right. So in a way, people kind of recognize that 
when uh, situations are dire, there may be a place for the iron hand and imposing of the order to prevent chaos. So it is something that you know people are 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 accepting as a as a force de majeure kind of a emergency situation. What are your thoughts to sciencely, optimistically <laughs> say goodbye to close out this one? Well, I mean, my idea is that we shouldn't only look at people's people at their worst, which is, you know, uh, this irrational hoarding of, of toilet paper and hoarding behavior. When disasters hit, the human beings move in two directions. One is a chaotic kind of crowd behavior direction, and the other one is the kind of uh, moving towards solidarity. People holding hands, helping the elderly, uh, helping each other. There's kind of, uh, it's kind of uh, in the opposite movement to that chaotic, selfish, uh, bestial uh, behavior. There is quite humane and human solidarity that kicks in. And we are seeing many examples of that as well. People in the NBA, we have NBA stars who are paying the salaries of the uh, the staff in the stadium. Right. That would be one example. Another example, people kind of helping the elderly, bringing them, them food and things like that. So, uh, yeah, there is good news and bad news, and it's all not all bad news. And yep. it looks like we are, we are now at this point, there is that political division between Republicans and Democrats, where Republicans basically rejected this as a hoax and Democrats embraced it. That is the vanishing and, and hopefully gradually people are getting with the program and realizing that this is not just another flu and this is serious and we should uh, basically cooperate rather than compete. Well, you're right. This is certainly an opportunity where we see, we see out there in the world fine examples of the better angels of our nature. And I know no finer example of the better angels of our nature than my beloved sibling, my dear brother who I love so much, Professor Awasadri, Director of World Islamic Studies at Lake Forest College. Thank you very much, Brother Ahmad. Thank you very much.